And that's where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a season called Advent, and we're living between the first coming of Jesus when he came in just uh, in the most humblest of ways. Um, he came humbly as, as a helpless child. So we live in between that reality and also the reality is that he's coming again. And when he comes again, he's going to come in the fullness of his glory. And yet we find ourselves right in the middle. What we're going to see in this series is what it means for us while we're in the middle. That means that if we are people of God, that there's a noble calling on our lives. That our lives are not to be just lived out for ourselves, but there's something greater than simply our lives and our little story that plays into God's greater story. And yet we're in the middle. Uh, I'm not sure about you, but, but would you agree with me that sometimes things just don't turn out the way that you want them to? Would you agree with me on that? Anybody give testimony to that? Like it just doesn't turn out the way? Anybody watch a game last night? Any Georgia fans? And verify, it just, just doesn't always go the way that you think it's going to, even at halftime as the game is going, <laughs> it's sliding off the shelf, and you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. And it did, and we lost. But also, later last night, I had my own little reality of this because I, I, I decided I was just going to trim my beard up a little bit. Um, and as I'm trimming my beard up, and it was great, it was like growing like the Amazon rainforest, so uh, I had my trimmers, and everything was going great, I trimmed it down really well, and my, my, uh, my beard trimmer was all full of hair, so I got my little brush out, and I was cleaning it up, just, I cleaned, and then I cleaned up the guard, I put the guard down, and then I just had the, just the bare trimmer in my hand, and I went, Bomp! and then I was like, hmm, okay, um, uh, but then, in, in all honesty, then I thought, well, that's probably not that bad. I mean, it was, it was just far enough out of reach where I couldn't see it. But then I thought it was going to be, I thought it was okay. So I was like, I took a shower and all that. I got out of the shower and I went to Marlon and I said, hey, um, so I had a little accident with the razor, uh, with, the, with the trimmer. And uh, just tell me, do you see like a stripe? And she's like, uh-huh. <laughs> um, so, uh, so then I had to go back in there and, uh, and now welcome to a 20, you know, a 20-year-old pastor, I guess. I don't know. Um, and what was really funny, and I thought about this this morning, even before I preached the first, in the, in the, preach the first service, is like, there's like the before and after, the video, and then, wow, look at this. This is, this is the new me, which is actually the old me. Anyway, sometimes life just doesn't go the way that you expect it, and yet you just got to move on, right? You just got to move on, and you have to figure it out, and that's what we're going to do. We're just going to figure it out. I want to figure you out a little bit, so I want to ask you this question just to kind of tease out where we're going today. Um, I want to ask you a question, and I need 100% participation. If I don't get that, it's going to be sad, and we might shame you publicly. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that, but still, I want you to, I, I, I really do, I want, I'm counting on you to do this, and it's really a simple question. It's, it's sort of personal, but not all that personal, so I think you'll, you'll be okay. Um, who would say that they're a person, before they go to bed at night, they have to flip the pillow over to get to the cold side of the pillow. Raise your hand if that's you. You flip your pillow over. All right, now, look at that. Everybody with their hands up, those are the sane people. That's who that is right there. Those are the sane people. Of course you have to, but don't you get in trouble. If you flip your pillow over to the cold side and yet you don't fall asleep, then what do you do? You flip it back over, but then it's not cold anymore. It's, it's, it's still warm from the last time, and then you're caught in this big helpless cycle, and I don't even know what you do in that situation. I just, I just pray and wait for Jesus to come. I don't, know, I don't know what you guys do, but I just lay there under the fan and attempt to go to sleep. And yet, e even in that, I was also outside of this morning, um, because this morning, like with all the storms, but isn't this just like the perfect time of weather to sleep, like winter time? I mean, who, who would give testimony to that? It's like, this is just great. Now there's more hands on that. Just great sleeping weather. It's like, you know, it's Saturday. But for me, it's Saturday. I'm like, I don't have to get up. And maybe for you, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And you're like, I have to get up, but I don't want to get up. And you roll over and it's cold. You just want to roll under the covers. This is just like a sleepy time of year. It is for me. Maybe it is for you. Several of you said it was. But if I'm honest, this is also a sleepy time in the history of our country. This is also a sleepy time. Then I'm not just talking about politics. I'm talking about the sleepy time of the people of God in our country. 
This is just a sleepy time in American Christianity. It's just people have just kind of lost their focus. If I'm honest, this is the way I feel about it. And maybe I'm wrong to some degree. And maybe it's not explaining your life. But I believe if you take, take a look back and, and don't become so sensitive of me saying that, I think maybe you would start to see some of this too. Like much of American Christianity is just kind of comfortably asleep. We're just kind of numb to what's going on. We like what we like. We don't like what we don't like. And we're okay with that. And we pick and choose what we're going to do spiritually. And in the midst of that, we're spiritually asleep and we're not engaging in the way that God wants us to. I believe that we're not engaging in the noble calling that God has placed on every follower of Jesus. And I just want you to know we have so much to lose if we don't do what it is that God's calling us to. I am thankful that in the Bible there are other references of what I think it's even more drastic than what we see in our country now. Um, But I look at the prophet Isaiah and his ministry existed approximately 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And it was a sleepy time for the, the people of Israel. They had had a lot of great things happen. They, David had already come and he had he'd been the king and now they were, they were waiting for another David to come. They were, another, they were waiting for the this, for this city of God to come and, and Isaiah's ministry and message would, would just be echoing that over and over and over and the people were spiritually asleep. They were spiritually asleep and they were even reaping the consequences of their own disobedience to God. And God had brought them, and this, Isaiah is a a long book, but before our reading, I I want us to know what's happening. God had brought about some consequences because the people were disobedient. And now Isaiah is spiritually awake, although the other, the people who he would be prophesying to were spiritually asleep. And we see just the the depth and heart of his words. I'm going to read a passage. This passage, I just want it to wash over you. I'm not going to go through and explain it. You can look it up later. But I just want you to sense and feel his frustration with what's going on, but also the faith. Because if we're going to be spiritually awake, we also have to be real about the way that we feel, but also be spiritually awake and alert to chase that noble calling that God has for us while we live in between. This is what it says in Isaiah. Let this word wash over you. Isaiah 63, 16. But you are our father, though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. Why, O Lord, do you make us wonder from your ways and harden our hearts so that we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are, that are your inheritance. For a, little while, for a little while, your people possess your holy place. But now our enemies have trampled down your sanctuary. We are yours from of old, but you have not ruled over them, and they have not been called by your name. Verse 1, chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend down the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name great, to make your name known to your enemies, and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right. You remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who's unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and make us waste away because of your sins. The last verse, verse 8. You, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. He himself is desperate for God. He is spiritually awake. He's spiritually alert. And he becomes this booming voice in his generation. A booming voice that that his words, his prophetic words would be echoed many times in the New Testament. 
His words would reverberate through the Gospels. His words were commonly used by Jesus. His words, then 700 years approximately before the birth of Jesus, his words would be just grasping and hoping for God to return. And yet we find ourselves now in the life between waiting for his second return. Someone once said, if a man remains motionless in his lounge for three or four hours, we can assume that he's asleep. If he should continue in that motionless condition for three or four days, we should assume him dead. If a Christian does nothing for Christ, lying motionless in a, on a pew or seat, you can assume he is asleep. If he stays in this course of uselessness, it is a fair presumption that he is dead. The question I, I want us to grapple with, uh, not just in this message, but all of Advent season, which starts today, is this. And this is for you Christians. If you're not a Christian, I already know the answer to this for you. But if you're a Christian, the question is this. Christian, are you asleep or are you awake? Are you asleep spiritually or are, are you awake. I mean, I get it. I know why that in our culture that we can be spiritually asleep. There's so many things to distract us from being spiritually alert and awake and alive and doing the things that we're supposed to. I mean, with all of the political debates, uh, debates, I mean, it's just a snoozer, is it not? Well, with all the temptation and people that you may hear, you don't hear it from me, but, but voices you may hear who are other Christian voices outside of this place who just say the Christian life is all about you that just causes you to go and be spiritually asleep. Uh, when you look at just this busy season, if we get swept up in the season from Thanksgiving up to Christmas, I mean, it just causes us to be spiritually asleep with all of the the good family activities they too can distract us and cause us to just snooze and be spiritually asleep also believing that being a christian is just about being successful or moral leads us to be spiritually asleep as we go into our main passage this morning into mark 13 we're going to see something that that echoes this idea of what it means to live in between. What it is that, that if you're a follower of Jesus, what it is that we're supposed to do while we're living in between. That there's a plan for us, that there's a purpose for us. It's greater than, than what you think it is. And I believe that God has, if you're a follower of Jesus, he has, he has empowered you already to do more than what you currently even are doing. So I want us to get this right. But I want us to go into it with the mindset where we understand this bottom line, that we need to be watching and waiting until the end and be faithfully or be faithful knowing he will come again. So we're, we're to be watching and waiting until the end. That's what we're supposed to do, be watching and waiting until the end, but be faithful knowing that he'll come again. This is what Jesus would echo uh, for my words, uh, echoing Jesus' words, that sounds terrible. I'm echoing some of Jesus' words, thank you, um, that uh, his word is, is definitely more important than mine. But in Matthew 13, our main passage, I want to set this up just a little bit. Jesus is having a conversation with the first four disciples. And the first, first four disciples, are they're, they're confused because they're starting to believe that, uh, or maybe to, to act upon this reality that that if I, I just want to know when Jesus is returning. Because I, in that, it's something I think many Christians are starting to believe or have believed now is they just want to know when Jesus is returning so that way they can get their life together before he returns. That way that when Jesus comes back, man, I want to look good. I want to be shiny. I want to be cleaned up, really cleaned up. I want to have my life all together. And that way when Jesus returns, that he would just look at me for who I am. But I just want you to know, Jesus looks at you at the whole span of your life. Not just what you think is the cleaned up version. And what Jesus would say to them, starting in, in, in Mark 13, is, is so profound. He, he goes through and he has this long storyline. And as they're expecting this, this time, like, just let us know the time. He says, no, no, no. The time isn't for you to know. All you need to know is there's a father who knows the time. 
All you need to know is you trust the Father through the hard times. You trust the Father when you're confused. You trust the Father when you're fearful. You trust the Father when the only thing you have is just a thimble of hope. You trust the Father. Jesus would say it like this, starting in verse 32. No one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and he puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task. And he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, there's a transition word. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight when the rooster crows or at dawn. We'll pause right there for a second and then I'm going to jump into verse 36. What's interesting about this particular gospel is Mark is, is writing this gospel, and of course there's four gospels, and each one of them is written with a slightly different perspective that all of them come together and they give this beautiful picture of the life and ministry of Jesus. And yet Mark's perspective is one with a Roman perspective. He just mentions in verse 35, he just mentions the four times of day. This is in regards to the four watches of the day for the Roman guards. The Jewish guards would only have three watches of the day. So even in the way that Mark would write this gospel, it was so that the Romans would even be able to engage it in it in, in, a, in a unique way, in a way that they would be able to understand. It's amazing things about the Bible when you study it out like that. Let's look at the last two verses. If he comes suddenly, do you let him find you sleeping? What I say to you, Jesus is saying, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So the message that Jesus is saying to the original four disciples, now he says, in context, he says, now I say to everyone, I say this to all followers of Jesus, to watch. Let's back up in verse 32. We're going to wade through some, some theological things. I don't know if you saw this or not, but there's kind of a theological issue that needs to be resolved. Because what Jesus says in there, he says the day and hour, he says he himself, the angels don't know. And even for whatever reason, only the Father knows, he doesn't even have the knowledge of when it's going to happen. But he says, but the Father does. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you, you're probably thinking, okay, doesn't Jesus know everything? There's like all those omni things, omniscient, omnipresent. Like there's these, these om, omnipotent, there's like all these omni things that I've heard in church about God. And how can, how can Jesus not know what the Father is, is only set to know is what Jesus says. So I want to give you two explanations. These are not my ideas. And, uh, but I do believe that these two main explanations, both of these rooted in people much smarter than me um, who have been, become heroes of the faith. And these people that I'm going to quote are from hundreds of years ago. So this is really a debate that started to, to exist in the second century, the second century. So the first main explanation is this. Jesus did not currently possess this knowledge at the time and that this is not of the things that Jesus was supposed to communicate. So that's the first explanation, that he just didn't currently possess the knowledge at that time or that that's just not of the things that Jesus was supposed to communicate. That could be... Uh, an explanation. People like Martin Luther and Augustine, they, they both um, were proponents of this first explanation. The, sex, the second explanation would be from uh, people by the name of John Calvin or John Chrysostom, um, he, people and heroes of the faith from centuries ago. If you have studied those names, you are probably familiar with them. But the second one is what you see um, it was simply this, as man, our Lord Jesus simply did not know. So it's pretty clear. Like, don't think too much into it. It's a mystery, but it wasn't really a mystery to Jesus, so don't allow it to be too much of a mystery to you. When it comes to the Bible, it's very common um, and popular right now, uh, and I think there's some danger in this. I, I think it's okay, but can be dangerous. There's a very common and popular thing happening, especially with young adults, Young adults seem to be more curious than older adults. Older adults seem to be, 
and they, they kind of grow in their faith and more set in their faith. But the newer generations, there's a, a popular thing of, uh, where they have just started to deconstruct some things that their parents have taught them. And it's the idea, well, I'm just going to tear this down to see if it's true. And while I, I'm not totally against that, I would say this, if you're going to deconstruct, and, and it comes to something like this, these two explanations, you may scratch your head and say, oh, I just don't know, and that's okay. But, but here's the thing, if you're going to deconstruct your faith, make sure that when you recon, you, you can deconstruct with one hand, but you have to reconstruct with truth, not stories, not opinions, not bad church stories, not good church stories, not what my mom and dad said, but what, what the truth is. So if you're going to deconstruct, you have to reconstruct at the same time with truth and not with opinion or any of those other things. If not, there's no foundation there and eventually it's going to collapse because it wasn't rooted and wasn't built upon the thing that it ought to have been. So what I want to do for you is I want to give you some, some points to consider as to regards to the thing and the, the theological implications of this. And all of these are rooted in truth. I'm not going to go through all these verses, but they will be on the screen. So you can look them up for yourself. I want you to be a, a studier and a student of the Bible. And I want to just whet your appetite so you go into the Bible to see things for yourself. So you don't just live your faith through my faith. With me so far? All right, here we go. So uh, the first uh, point of reference is this. And there's seven all total. First one is this. Jesus, while being God, had a limited knowledge of things on earth. We know this. If you go to Luke 2.52, you see this that he had a limited knowledge of things on earth. Point number one. Point number two, Jesus is completely convinced that he is the beloved son. As a matter of fact, in the, the main passage that we just went through in Mark 13, was the only, I believe it's the only time in the gospel of Mark that Jesus refers to himself as the son. So Jesus is completely convinced that he is the beloved son. No real mystery to Jesus. Third thing, Jesus is completely one with the Father. If you go to John 10, 30, it'll verify that truth. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. This can be confirmed in John 1, 1 through 3, and then verse 14. Jesus is fully God and fully man. No mystery there. The Word of God says it, so therefore I do believe it. Jesus, the fifth thing, Jesus is completely submissive to the Father's will. In Mark 14, 35 and 36, and John 4, 34, it echoes the same thing. Jesus is completely submissive to the Father's will. Jesus, even in going to the cross, was in accordance with the Father's will. When Jesus taught us to pray, it was that the Father's will be done, right? So it's, he is submissive to the Father's will will. Sixth thing, Jesus is completely confident in the Father's plan. Again, Matthew 6 would verify that. He, he's completely confident in the Father's plan. So the main takeaway of mine from all those scriptures that I just referenced and those truths to back it up, Jesus wasn't confused, so we can't let this mystery derail our mission. He wasn't confused. It may be a mystery to you, but you have to believe in faith. It wasn't a mystery to Jesus. He pressed into what God had for him. Back to our passage in verse 32. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. The day and the hour. We are, as the people of God, we are to be the, the people who are doing the work of God as citizens of heaven. A phrase that would sum up this is born again believers are to live out their mission daily because we have a Father in heaven that loves us and we have the cross of Jesus that saves us. So if you think about it in these terms, you have nothing to lose. If you as a follower of Jesus were to embrace whatever it is that God is calling you to obey, you have nothing to lose. You have a father that loves you better than, than your earthly father. And we've, we have some good fathers in this church. But our, our heavenly father loves better than earthly fathers ever could. And he loves us. 
And yet we also, as followers of Jesus, we, we have the cross of Jesus that saves us. So we have nothing to lose. We just simply have to obey. We have to live out this mission. We have to be about the kingdom. We have to pursue Jesus at all costs. We have to wake up spiritually. Two verses that back up this phrase. First one comes from Ephesians 2.13. It says, In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So think about this, Christian. You were so far away from God, but yet the blood of Christ, your submission, your acceptance, your confession, and your repentance, and the blood of, in, in just accepting the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for you has brought you near to the Father. And Galatians 4, 7 says this, that you are no longer a slave. You're no longer a slave to sin. Prior to giving your life to Jesus, you were a slave to sin. You were, you were enslaved and many of us didn't even know it. But you're no longer a, a slave to sin, but you're God's child. You're God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So we are co-heirs with Christ. We have an ability to live in the spirit, to be connected with God, that the Holy Spirit dwells within every believer. And we can live in the reality of that, live in the strength that that gives, living in the presence of God. And this is part of our inheritance now. But also, as, as Christians, as we're living in between and we're waiting for the fullness of glory to be revealed in Jesus' second coming, we also know that not only do we have this inheritance now, but we even have even a greater inheritance waiting for us when Jesus returns or when we go home. These are powerful truths to think that, that God would allow us to be within family, and that God would invite us to do his work. And that's what it says in verse 33. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and he puts his servants in charge, each with an assigned task, and he tells the one at the door to keep watch. What I find funny about this is I couldn't help but think about whenever I was a kid and my dad and my stepmother would leave the house and it was just my brother and I and, and they would always give us a very like similar spiel to this. We're leaving. They would look at my brother and you're in charge. Take care of your brother. Like say things like, don't destroy the house. We're gonna come back in a little while. We expect you to do this and do this and this. And it was all, usually a bunch of chores. And we're coming back. So then they would leave. But what we heard was, no one's in charge. We don't know if they're coming back. We've got some free time. That's what we heard. And yet many of us as Christians, we, we may be spiritually asleep and we're not watching, and we're not alert. We're not active in our faith. And we were just hearing what we want to hear, even from the Bible. If we're living in the life between, we're waiting for the, for the second coming of Jesus, we need to take hold of what Jesus just said in verse 33. Be on guard. Be on alert be watching be preparing advent is a season of preparing it's not a matter of celebrating christmas the world is doing that it's a time of preparing our hearts for the celebration that is christmas the esv says it this way be on guard keep awake I have a couple ideas as to maybe why that, that why even well-meaning Christians are asleep. And these are all, I believe, temptations of Satan. And there's five all total for me, and it could be a longer list. But the first thing I have in my list is this. 
One of the temptations why we're not spiritually awake is because we're living without limits. We're living without limits. In regards to what I preached to you last week, we're living without limits. So we're just living life full bore. We're just doing our own thing and faith is just an add-on. If we have time for it, great. But if we don't have time for it, we're moving on. So I believe that's one of the temptations we have in, in just all of the things that we can do that actually hinder us in the life that we're supposed to live in between. The second temptation is just living for ourselves. Simply living for ourselves. We're just forgetting or not living with the reality that we have a noble task in front of us, that we are co-heirs with Christ, that we are living in the Spirit, at least we have the ability of, to live in the presence of God by the Holy Spirit, and we have all these great things as citizens of the kingdom of God. So we can live for ourselves and become distracted. Another thing that distracts us and tempts us is just living for happiness. And just living for things that make us happy right now. This, this message right now is as common with a sixth grader as it is with a senior adult. Because there's always these nagging temptations to just do what makes you happy. And sadly, the Christian life is not a life to be lived just to make you happy. It's to make, it's to make you joyful, which is, it so transcends happiness. Happiness is fleeting. Some of you parents have, are raising your kids in such a way to just make them happy. But how about you shift that to try and make them holy? How about instead of trying to make your spouse happy... It's like a dog chasing its tail. Instead, live for the higher calling of seeking to make them holy. So we have living without limits, living for ourselves, living for happiness. Another one is this, just being lazy in our walk with God. Of just saying, you know what? I just, I'm not feeling it today. I'm not gonna go to church. I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. I'm not gonna go to church today. I'm not feeling it. I'm not gonna go to community group today. I'm not feeling it. I'm not, I don't need to go out and I don't need to, to get a Moses or a Joshua. I'm not feeling it. I'm just, I'm just gonna live for me for a while. I'm just gonna do my thing and I'm just not feeling it. And that is, that is somebody who's, who's missed the ultimate goal and the prize to be more like Jesus and to evangelize the lost world. So it's being lazy in your walk with God. The last one, is just being inactive in the formation of your inner spiritual life. It's just being inactive. To where you may read your Bible, but it's not intentional. You may pray, but it's not intentional. You're, you're, not, you're not aware of and awake to the reality that, that the Spirit of God is trying to, to form you to be more like Jesus, to, that your life would look more like Jesus' life. Instead, you're just inactive, and you're just kind of, you're just kind of hodgepodge your spiritual walk. You're like, I'll go to church when I want to. I'll dabble in this little devotion. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go any deeper in my walk. It's, and in that you're being unaware and inactive in who it is that you're becoming as a follower of Jesus. The word charge in this passage in verse 34, it says, it's like a man going away he leaves his house and he puts his servant in charge. The word charge means authority or jurisdiction. And better put, it's an area that you have rule or control. To think that Almighty God would allow us, that he would put us in charge, that he would, he would allow us to have a jurisdiction, an area of influence, that we're to live our life for him and for his glory. It's amazing to me. Verse 35, the word said, therefore keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back. That's whether in the evening or at midnight when the rooster crows or at dawn. To, to keep watch was something common with the Jewish people because in their culture, the, uh, there would be temple guards and then the captain of the temple guards. And as you can gather by the title, captain of the temple guards, the captain of the temple guards was in charge of the regular temple guards. And the temple guards were supposed to be awake, 
physically awake, guarding. That's what they do. And yet the captain of the temple guard, if he were to go around and he would find one of the other temple guards sleeping, he would have one of two courses of action. Neither one of these are, are really favorable. I'm glad this didn't happen to me when I fell asleep on watch in the Navy. Um, because I did, unfortunately. But he, the first thing that the captain of the temple guard would do if he found one of the temple guards asleep is he could just beat him. Like, that's, that's fun. Like, that would wake you up. And I don't know if it, like, there was like an escalation process, but he could either beat him or he could set his clothes on fire. So, and you set, you set a dude's clothes on fire and all of a sudden he can dance. So that, I don't know, maybe that was a goal. I'm not really sure. Either way, he's going to wake up. So it was a very drastic measure. And what I love about the word of God is the word of God speaks into itself. And in Revelation 16, 15, it says this. Listen to this. It's amazing. So fascinating to me. Connecting all these dots. Revelation 16, 15 says this. Blessed is he who stays awake and he keeps his clothes with him. Yeah, because he wasn't going to have clothes with him if they're all burnt up, I guess. I love how if you actually go to the Word of God, the Word of God speaks into the Word of God. It's not just circular reasoning. It can be verified outside of the Bible too. Things, many things in the Bible can be verified outside. But I love it how the Bible is so interesting and so cohesive. As we're about finished, I want to give you five questions. And these questions aren't my questions. They're for someone much smarter than me, someone by the name of Timothy Keller. And he actually had nine questions, but I, I, I whittled it down to five questions. And these five questions, you can find these online too, by the way. These five questions that I'm going to give you are, are questions that Timothy Keller gave. And these questions were to rouse sleepy Christians. That was the goal. And if you Google it, that's what you'll see. Of, of the, I believe there were nine, did I have five? Here's the first one. First question, maybe you want to write this down. How real has God been this week to your heart? How real has God been to your heart this week? Second question, how clear and vivid is your assurance and certainty of God's forgiveness and fatherly love? So how clear and vivid is your assurance and certainty of God's forgiveness and fatherly love? Again, these questions to arouse sleepy Christians. Third question, do you really sense his presence in your life? It doesn't get much more clear than that. Do you really sense his presence in your life? Fourth question, have you been finding scripture to be alive and active? Have you been finding the scriptures to be alive and active? When you read the word of God, does it it speak to you? Does it draw something out of you? Does it encourage you? Does it compel you? Last question. Are you finding God's grace more glorious and moving than you have in the past? So are you finding God's grace more glorious and moving than you have in the past? And what this speaks into is, since the point of your salvation, have you been growing in the awareness of your sin? Because you can be saved in a moment, but God sanctifies, he sets us apart by the work of his spirit, by the renewing of your mind, and he sets us apart. And that question, are you finding God's grace more glorious and moving than you have in the past, is is you have this growing understanding and desire and deep need for forgiveness of your sins because God continually reveals those sins to you. So as I wrap up my talk, and we get ready to transition to take the Lord's Supper. I want to tell you a story. I find it interesting that this story actually correlates with something that happened in Georgia. There was a gentleman before the American Revolution by the name of George Whitefield or George Whitfield. It can be pronounced both ways. It looks like Whitefield, but they call it Whitfield. And his ministry began in Europe, and then... He came to the United States, actually to Savannah, right outside Savannah. And he was inspired to start up an orphanage. (laughs) Then after he developed this orphanage, he needed more funding, so he went back to Europe. After he went 
to Europe. He went to Europe to just gather the, the money and he came back to the orphanage. I don't know what spurred it, but after this, George Whitfield would become one of the most prominent figures in American Christianity. It was a, it was a time where churches were very sparse. Darkness was real. People were asleep. Even people who were supposed to be living a life for God, they were still spiritually unaware or asleep. George Whitfield is an interesting fellow because he had such a booming voice. But to look at him, you would say, wow, he does, he's not much to look at because he's well known for being cross-eyed. But he had such a, just a, a booming voice, a voice that we don't know if this is legend or not, but a voice that, that was said to be heard a mile away. And people came in droves. And through his ministry and the ministry of others, there was this great event that happened in America called the First Great Awakening. And his ministry was unique because he said things that had not been said. He was doing things in ministry of which he got a lot of opposition. He was doing things in ministry that other people weren't doing. But God used him to wake up a nation, a nation that existed at the time. And I believe still today that God could use one person and perhaps a person sitting in this room. I believe that God can work through one person to, to make another great awakening in our country. And it wasn't just George Whitfield. That there was other people who, just the wave of the Spirit. But it can begin with one. Would you be the one? Would you be the one who would decide today, I am going to be awake spiritually. I'm not going to allow my, my wife to be awake and I'm not going to count that as my faith and I'm not going to allow my, my husband to just have a faith and I'm going to kind of live off of that. I'm not going to have my kids and particularly the one kid who has it all together. I'm not going to look at that kid. I'm not going to live my faith out of, out of my kid. But I wonder if you would just say, you know what? I want to be spiritually awake because perhaps there could be another great awakening Maybe it won't be as big as the first. Maybe it'll be bigger than the first. Maybe it just reaches those in your home. But if that was the case, wouldn't it still be worth it? I want to give you two takeaways from this passage. And, and again, I believe these two takeaways will make maybe some things that are unclear crystal clear. So the takeaways before we go into the Lord's Supper are these. Connectivity to God will help you to be watchful for the purposes of God. Connectivity to God will help you to be watchful for the purposes of God. So in this season called Advent, in the life that we're to be living out in between, maybe embrace this season to where you dig into your faith and to be connected with God. The two primary means that you're going to be connected with God is through prayer and the Word of God. Those are the two primary ways. There are other ways, but those are the two primary ways. The connectivity with God will help you to be watchful for the purposes of God, for you to be spiritually awake to the things that God would have you do in your home, in your own, in your own spiritual life, and in your workplace or at your school. Second takeaway is this. Activity with God and for God will wake you up to the things of God. So some of you, you're connected with God through Bible study and prayer. And I'm going to encourage that. I would say praise God for you and praise God for that. But also in that, maybe some of you, you're just not doing any activity for God. You're not serving. You're just doing your own thing. And you explain it away. I just don't have time. I'm busy. It's a work cycle. I'm, I'm the boss. So I'm the boss. I'm always thinking about work. And I just don't have time. And I just want you to know that's just such an opportunity for you to be spiritually asleep. And maybe that's the reason why you are spiritually asleep. But the way you could wake up is connectivity to God and then activity with God and for God. And that will wake you up to the things of God. I want us to, to pause for a minute. And I want to give some space for the, the Spirit of God to work. 
And, and I want us to have just a couple of seconds of silence. And I really want you to ask the Spirit of God, am I awake or am I asleep? And if I'm awake, am I alert? Because there's a difference there. So I want you to ask the Spirit that, Christian. And, and then I'm going to close this in another prayer before we take the elements. Let's pray together.